our monthly Progressive Democrats of America Chicago chapter meeting. Um, we have them on the last Tuesday of every month. And we generally have a speaker on the last Tuesday of every month. Uh, usually, why we have them on Tuesday here is the pub is open. And for some reason, tonight, it's not. So I apologize for that. Um, we expected it to be open so you could have a pint. Um, they didn't tell me till I got here. So. Um, Anybody want to do a beer run? <laughs> <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> I got a 50 on it. <laughs> <laughs> He's up. He's up. Um, so next month, we always have a speaker every month. Next month, we are going to have Mary Kay Devine from Women Employed. And she is going to be talking to us about building a better future for working women. So being treated fairly in the workplace, able to, to attain the skills we need for the jobs we want and respected for the work we do. And she's been an activist for a long time. She started out um, in the union space and she's going to be coming to talk to us about how we can help um, as activists in helping women achieve what they want in the workplace. So I encourage you to come next month. Uh, I will see what I can do about having that pub open um, or and or going on a run myself before I enter the room um, as enticement. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, I was serious. <laughs> you are serious? <laughs> He's serious. I would bet for everyone. I just so there's one more thing well, that, before I introduce Troy, um, there's one more thing that we are pulling together here at the Progressive Democrats of America. We're putting together a gubernatorial forum and we are going to have all eight candidates here either on October 21st or November 18th. It will be a moderated forum um, for you to come and learn about their views. And it's really a forum for us as progressives to hear them speak about their beliefs on progressive issues because we know that that is not getting covered in the mainstream media. We know that they're not getting asked the hard questions, which is why we're putting this forum together as a collective with other progressive organizations alongside us and why we're having a professional moderator so that we can get the answers we want from these candidates so that we can make a smart decision come Are primary. Um, well, it's between two dates right now because I have to wait for the candidates to give me when can they come. Um, October 21st and November 18th. So if you're going to any, I know Pritzker is speaking Thursday. Thursday. Diane, what, Diane, what's the Thursday detail? Oh. Thursday at Horner Park Field House. Pritzker will be speaking at 7 o'clock. So if you want to talk to him and ask him if he's going to come to our forum, then maybe he'll say yes. I will ask him for you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be there. Um, so without further ado, would you like me to do a formal introduction of you? Sure. Give me time to figure out what's wrong with the projector. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's his official bio. It seems that many of you already know who and how great he is. Uh, Troy LaRivier has been a student teacher, principal, and parent at both public and private schools in Chicago. He led the number one ranked neighborhood school in Chicago, Blaine Elementary, in 2013 after two years of unprecedented student improvement at Blaine, Troy became the first Chicago principal to speak openly about the destruct destructive school policies of Chicago's mayor and unelected school board. He maintains an education blog that receives between 10,000 and 200,000 views per post. In 2016, Troy was featured in two campaign ads for presidential candidate Bernie Sanders, one of which was the moving two-minute national TV ad called America Beyond, which used Troy's life story to represent the hope and possibilities of the Sanders campaign. In May 2016, by an overwhelming majority, Troy was named elected president of named elected president of the Chicago's Principals and Administration Association, CPAA. Since assuming the presidency, Troy has focused on building a member-driven association that unites principals' voices to impact state and local policy. And Troy will be speaking to us for a bit, and then we will have Q&A. Oh, and please, please go to the mic, because we are um, 
uh, taping for CAN TV so that we can distribute this um, on the PDA uh, Facebook page. By the way, PDA Chicagoland, if you want to follow us. Um, so please go to the mic when we have questions. Thanks. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I spent this afternoon at Loyola University, and we were there discussing a Supreme Court decision in the case of Andrew F. Uh, versus his school district. He was a student who received special education services. And the school district, the parents didn't think what he, what was in his IEP was ambitious enough. It was minimal. He wasn't making a lot of progress. And they sent him to a private school, took him out of public school, sent him to a private school where he did make quite a bit of progress. And they attempted to get back into the public system after that private experience in, 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 in an effort to get a little bit more from the school district in terms of his IEP. He said, look what he did here. You can do it here. Uh, but they offered an IEP that was about the same as the ones he had been getting. And so they took him to court, and they lost case after case until they reached the Supreme Court, where they eventually won. And at stake here was this idea of what kind of education is adequate. Uh, is the child making minimum progress adequate, or should we do something more ambitious? And the Supreme Court decided that the standard had to be a bit more ambitious, that the child needed to be able to, the goals have to be to get the child to meet challenging goals based on his or her own circumstances, which was a huge victory for special education advocates and a huge defeat for those attempting to redefine what the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act says in terms of what it means um, for the kind of education we have to provide to students with disabilities. They were basically trying to say a minimal, minimal progress, a minimal, uh, minimal, minimal progress and minimal, minimal resources toward that progress. That's what's really underneath it, right? Minimal progress was enough. The Supreme Court unanimously, to my surprise, um, agreed with the parents. And the point that I tried to make here, and this is, goes beyond school, that what is underneath this decision, you know, it's about on its face what kind of education is adequate on its face. But if you look at this case, or if you'll go all the way back to the Brown versus Board of Education case, what's underneath the words on paper is a question of how much is this child worth? That is what is at the heart of this decision. How much do we invest in these children's education? How much do we invest in ensuring that they get to live up and reach their God-given potential? Right? And there are always forces on one side that don't seem to have the opinion that certain children are worth the investment. And those were the forces on the side of the district in this case, but we know there are forces far beyond that particular school district. There are forces right here in our city that don't think that certain children are worth the investment. And it goes beyond children. Those same forces don't believe that certain communities are worth an investment. Are you all hearing me? Right? And so underneath all of this is this question of who do we as a society, because we as a society pay for school, who do we as a society, because we as a society, through our tax dollars, whenever the government says it's doing something to invest in job growth or just invest in the community, that's our money. Those are our elected representatives deciding what to do with the resources we have pooled together with our tax dollars. Are, we making, are you following me here? Yeah, yeah. 
right? Who is worth investing in and who is not? And so this is going to be a presentation today about schools, but many of the principles that underlie it go far beyond education, right? They're the same principles we have to think about when we're thinking about where are we going to invest in bringing a Walmart in or are we going to invest in local business and job growth and development? Am I making sense here? Yeah. Okay. So, I was an assistant principal at Johnson Elementary School on the west side. I was an assistant principal at Social Justice High School on the southwest side. Uh, in both of those places, we were able to come in and create achievement, create a culture and climate that was better than the one that we inherited. After I left Johnson, many of you know I went to Blaine. And we were able to take a high performing school and make it even more high performing. After leaving Blaine, or being removed from Blaine, uh, I inherited the office of president of the Chicago Principals and Administrators Association. And I don't want to air too much of the organization's dirty laundry, <laughs> but I'll say this. When I came into the organization, we did not have a policy agenda. We didn't have official positions on things. We were paying the lobbyists $3,200 a month with no policy agenda to lobby for. <laughs> All right. And so just like in all the other places I'd been, there was, a neat, there was some room for improvement. <laughs> and so we began to develop and construct teams of principals and assistant principals to form policy teams, right? among other things that we did. And we began to, because the perspective that we had is that that very perspective itself, the perspective of principals and assistant principals is unlike any perspective out there, and it's the one least heard from. When a policymaker creates a law, and they want that law implemented in a school, who do they give it to to implement? Principals and assistant principals. Right? We are at that nexus between where the policies are made and where they're implemented. We have that whole school view. Uh, it's not better than anybody else's, but it's unique and valuable, very valuable. That if we were at the table when some of these policies were made, we could see unintended negative consequences a mile away, but we're not at the table. And so we felt like we needed to get our voices into the policy conversation. And so that's what we began to do. And the work you're about to see is the product of the work we did to get our voices into this special education conversation. And so all of this work was produced by principals and assistant principals on a committee that was actually led by an assistant principal. And so almost immediately when I came into office, there were grumblings about changes to special education policy and what they feared those changes were going to do to their ability to meet the needs of students with special needs. Sure enough, August and September came around and those changes were implemented. And I don't know if I've ever received more complaints about a policy or a set of policies than I received about the changes to special education. And so I want to talk about three of them. I'm going to give you an overview of those three changes. Then I'm going to focus in on the third one. Everybody ready? Yeah. All right, I'm laying the foundation here. So the first change, and I think, <coughs> so you can listen to me, <laughs> because this is just going to prompt me to talk. <laughs> so the first change are procedural violations of the student's individualized education program. The IEP. I need the lights on. Sorry, guys. We need the lights on for the video. The IEP. So the IEP has, that is the guiding document for what services a student gets. 
And as we all know, the more that goes into that, particularly in terms of services that have to be staffed, then the more we're investing monetarily into that student. And there are forces that want us to invest as little as possible. And so CPS created a series of rules this year that, would, that were designed to prevent students from getting services put into their IEP to make it far more difficult than it has to be. There's a lawyer's uh, committee. I think there are four or five different legal organizations that produced a joint letter to CPS outlining how each and every one of their new guidelines violates federal law. So we have a completely different report to deal with that. It's not what I'm going to be talking about today, but I want you to know it exists. CPS is blatantly and flagrantly violating federal law to prevent services from being added to the IEPs of the students in CPS. That's number one. Number two, CPS has instituted a series of budgetary schemes that are designed so that even if the service gets into the IEP, you won't have the funding to provide the service. And so what do I mean funding schemes? There are three major schemes. The first thing they've done is they've eliminated needs-based budgeting, where you budget based on projections. That's how we budget. We look at the students we had at the end of last year, who we're projected to get, who we're projected to keep. We look at what their needs are, and then there's a budget. You get the district hands the school a budget to meet those needs. Instead of doing that, CPS said, we're just going to give you what you spent last year. Not what you were budgeted last year, what you spent last year. There are many problems with that. I'll mention one or two. Let's say I get a student in May. I'm going to spend on that student, if he has a service in the IEP that requires an aid, I'm going to spend on that aid uh, enough to cover May and half of June. The next year I get what I spent, but I'm going to have that kid all year next year, not May and June. Does everybody understand here? So not only did they give them what they spent instead of what they're budgeted for, because you never know who's going to come in your school. Um, not only did they give them what they were budgeted for, but they also, excuse me, what they spent the year before, but they also said, you know what? We're actually not gonna give you what you, we, you spent the year before. We're gonna give you 96% of what you spent the year before. Well, really, we'll give you 100%, but we're gonna freeze 4% of it. And so they froze 4% of special education funds. 4%. And they said, well, look, we're not, you know, the freezes, we're just saving this for you. So for a rainy day, if you need it later on, all you have to do is let us know and file an appeal. And then you can have access to that 4%. Everybody understand? Mm -hmm. So they gave you what? So number one, um, they gave you what you spent the year before instead of budgeting for the students in front of you. Number two, they froze 4% of funds across the board. Number three, they're pitting general education students against special education students in terms of their needs. What do I mean by that? For the first time, if you don't have enough money to cover your special education students, you have to use money from your general education fund to cover those needs. The problem is, Everything in your general education fund is on a line to be spent for a particular purpose. And so if you spend that, in order to spend that for special ed, you have to cut whatever you were going to spend on general ed. That could be a teacher. If you have four first grade classrooms or something, all, cut one of those and make those three and just crowd all those kids together and overcrowd their classrooms. If you have an assistant principal, gone. Decimate your leadership team. A clerk, gone. A librarian, gone. A tutor, an after-school program, gone, so that you can now fund the legally mandated requirements of the IEP, which also makes you, as a principal, less likely 
to want to put the service in there if you know you're going to have to fund it by cutting from the rest of your school. Does everybody follow me? In fact, I had, we had over half of our principals in a survey respond to the question, do the new requirements make it more likely that you will, would deny a service to a student who has a legitimate need for that service? Over half the principals said, yes, it makes it more likely. And so those are the three budgeting schemes. Everybody follow me so far? All right. Now, so what they've done is create a situation where the underfunding of special ed is being used to force principals to understaff general ed in order to meet the needs of special ed. So understaffing is the goal. And this is happening in the district that is already 849th out of 854 school districts in the ratio of students to certified staff. 849th out of 854, almost dead last in the state of Illinois. Certified staff are people who require an Illinois State Board of Education certificate in order to practice. It could be a teacher, a principal, an assistant principal, a counselor, a nurse, a special education classroom assistant. They all have to have some kind of certificate. And in the ratio of certified staff to students, CPS is almost dead last, meaning it is one of the most understaffed districts in the state. Let's take a look at what that means at a school, at the average Illinois school, not the best Illinois school, not an above average Illinois school, at the average Illinois school with 600 students, they have 58 professional educators there to serve those students. Because their ratio is 10.3 to one. 10.3 certified staff to one, average. They have 58 educators. In Chicago, the ratio is 15.6 to 1, which, which means that while at a regular Illinois or average Illinois school, they have 58 professional educators to serve 600 students. In Chicago, they have 38. Excuse me. Did I say that right? Yep, 38. It sounded so bad, I thought <laughs> I had under, <laughs> I had went too far now. Yes, it is 38, so that's 20 fewer educators at every CPS school with 600 kids than the average in Illinois. And so it is in that situation where they are now using special education to force principals to even further understaff what is already virtually the most understaffed district in this state. So what if I'm a principal and I don't want to understaff my school? I'm going to file an appeal. What happens when the appeal gets filed? Let's take a look. So, I almost want to just turn one light out. <laughs> what this shows is that 158 schools filed appeals. 158. 600. And I'll tell you why there's this many who did not <laughs> later on. 158 schools filed appeals. They asked in total for $24 million. They received $3.5 million. So they said, just file the appeal if you need more resources so that you can get access to that 4% or more than that 4%. And they only granted less than 15% of what was requested. They denied over 85% of what was requested. Now think about that, because if they don't give it to them, they can't spend it. And remember how the new budgeting works. You get not what you were budgeted last year, but what you spent last year. And so if they only give us 96% and freeze the 4% this year, then next year, they're going to give you 96% of what you spent last year. And if you didn't spend the 4%, it doesn't count anymore. And so there's a, a progressive spiral of disinvestment each year built into this system. 
96% of 96% of 96% progressively lower funding. This is systematic disinvestment. Someone, if you believe in something, you invest in it. And investment is belief made visible. If you don't invest, you don't believe. And the people that run this district do not believe in our students as is evidenced by the fact that they will not invest in our students. But what about this 3.5 million? This is where the conversation gets a little more tragic. So these are three jars. I don't know if you all can read that. But on the left, there's a jar that's 60% full. And the label under it is majority white. In the middle is a jar that's 14% full. And the label under it is majority Hispanic. And on the right is a jar that's 9% full. And the label under it is majority black. This visual represents how much of what a school asked for did it get. And so majority Schools that serve communities that are majority white got 60% of what they asked for. Schools that serve communities that are majority Hispanic got 14% of what they asked for. And schools that serve communities that are majority black got 9% of what they asked for. Someone does not believe in our students. And they don't believe in some even less than they believe in others. Now, there are two things you can notice when you look at something like this. And I think it's important to notice both, but normally people only notice one. We notice the stark difference between them. And that has to be noticed and it has to be addressed. But another thing we cannot forget, that we cannot fail to notice, is that nobody got everything they needed. No one. That is the function of racism. To make a certain group of people feel privileged when they're being fleeced just like everyone else, but just not quite as much. That is the function. That is it. That's why it was, that's why race was invented. To make a certain group of people feel like they're getting a little bit more because they're looking at their position relative to someone that's getting even less, not understanding that all of them are being fleeced. They're all being cheated. Now, this chart represents that little dark red sliver represents 6% of that pie. That dark red sliver represents the 10 majority white schools that applied for funding. 10 out of 158 is 6%. Got it? The larger piece of red represents how much of that total fund was given to that 6%. Everybody got it? Which was 29%. Now, these are the actual schools. Sure. Mount Greenwood, $248,000. Cassell, $300,000. Edison Park, $140,000. Uh, Oriole Park, pending. Hamilton, $35,000. We can go on down the line, but the point is at the end, it totals to $1,033,000. So these are organized by the percentage of white students from 83.6 at Mount Greenwood has the highest percentage of white students in the district in totality to 50.3 at Waters. All serve a majority white student population. And they got $1 million from this process. Now the next slide is going to show the schools that have the lowest percentage of white students. All of them 0%. And it's going to show a total at the bottom. Does everybody see that? Zero. Not a dime. 
This is a graphic representation of both charts that I just showed. So can folks see that? And so what I did, I decided to do, was I we drew a scale. And on one side of the scale, we put four schools that serve majority white communities and how much they got, $863,000. Four schools, $863,000. Then I went over to the majority black column, and there were 76 schools that applied for funds. And so I began, I ranked them according to what they got from the least to the most, and the least, most of the least were zeros. And I began to count upward until I reached that amount that was close to the 863,000 that the four schools that serve majority white students got. How many schools do you think I counted up? Out of the 76 that were there. Was 74. The total they got was 700. I think that says 60. So over 800,000 here. Are you So many apply for even more than that 4%. But yes, the 4% is part of what most of them were applying for. So there's a there's an African American school, for example, that applied for 800,000 dollars because that's what they needed, and they got zero. And I know 800,000 is more than 4% of anybody's budget, <laughs> right? So they had to be applying for more than that 4%. So this graphic represents how this represent rep, this graphic represents schools that got more than 100,000. So who got the big dollars? What schools got the big dollars? And so if you're a red dot, you got more than 100,000. So as you can see, Half of the dots that represent the schools that serve majority white students are red. So 50% of those schools receive more than $100,000. 60 majority Hispanic schools applied, four of them received more than $100,000. That's 6.6%. .6%. The next slide is going to show what the same thing, but majority white, majority black. One, one school, that's 1% versus 50%. And that one school, interestingly enough, is an AUSL school, Academy of Urban School Leadership. Academy of Urban School Leadership was founded by Mr. Martin Koldyke. And I remember reading a piece in the Tribune about all of the mayor's campaign contributors and Mr. Dyke's contribution up to that point, which was 2015, was $55,000. Oh, no. And he, his school just happens to be the one majority black school that got over 100 grand. Now, to paint the full picture, other AUSL schools did apply and got zeroed out. But one of his was the only one that got more than 100,000. I thought that was interesting to note. No, it's not. AUSL is interesting. It's privately run, but it's public. All the teachers are CTU. They're usually young. They usually fire the whole staff. Uh, it's one of those turnaround models, right, where they fire the whole staff and then come in with this private management organization. They hire a bunch of new teachers that they themselves have trained. I worked in an AUSL. When I talked about Johnson, it was an AUSL school. Um, so that's how they work. You know, so I met Mr. Coldy. Um, I was in that, just like I was in CPS, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. So that's over 100 grand. Now I started looking at class. I put race aside, began to look at class, because that's probably one of the more important things for us to look at, that we look at probably not enough, because it is class that race was created to make us avoid. Right? The idea of race was specifically cultivated and developed to keep us focused on race consciousness so that we would not embrace class consciousness. 
because there are a hell of a lot more poor and working class people than there are white or black people. Am I making sense here? You know, there's an interesting piece over there. I was reading this. I have to, I'm going to step away. I guess I should bring this. Hopefully it will reach. I'm going to come over here and read. This is my understanding, a document that is um, sort of like the uh, Declaration of Independence for the Irish. Right? And it caught my eye, so I came over to read it when I, I've never seen it or heard of it. And there's this piece in here where it says, the Republic guarantees religions, religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunity to all its citizens, and declares its resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and all of its parts, cherishing all the children of the nation equally and oblivious of the differences, carefully fostered by an alien government which have divided a minority from the majority in the past. Cherishing all the children of the nation equally and oblivious of the differences which have been carefully fostered by an alien government. Right? That strategy was used on them and it was used on us. How many people here know that in the beginnings of the colonial and colonial America, African indentured servants worked alongside European indentured servants in the same miserable conditions. Who knew that? Good. How many folk know that they intermarried? that the concept of white and black hadn't been developed yet. You were an African, I was an Irishman or a Scotsman, but this idea of black and white had not been developed. Right? They ate together, they worked together, they ran away together, they married together, they ran away and deprived the master of their labor together. Right? And eventually, they rebelled together. And it was after those rebellions, that race-based slavery and the idea of race were developed to divide them, to give the poor Europeans a sense and have them identify a sense that they were something special based on the color of their skin and to make them identify themselves more with their oppressor than they did with the person they were once working alongside of. Am I making sense here? I was on the slide that showed the communities by wealth, where if you look at the 10 schools that serve the wealthiest communities and add up, and by 10 wealthiest communities, I mean the schools that had the lowest percentage of low-income students, they add up to $963,000. And so I went and added up. There they are. I must have tripped over something. <laughs> there they are. Ten wealthiest school communities, 963,000. And so then I took the schools that had the highest percentages of low-income students. In other words, the schools that serve the poorest communities in Chicago. Anybody want to take a guess as to what that number at the bottom says. Not a dime. Not a dime. And this represents it visually, just like the other one, except now it's wealth rather than race. It's class rather than race. And so I decided, once again, to take the seven majority white schools that did receive money, add up what they got, put them on one side of the scale, and then began to add 
schools, excuse me, the seven majority wealthy schools, seven schools that serve wealthy communities. Then I took the schools that serve poor communities and began to add them up based on how much they got, from the lowest to the highest, and I just kept asking, how many schools do you think I had on the other side of the scale before I reached an amount that was even close to what was awarded to the schools that serve the seven wealthiest communities? There were 158 applicants, 148 if you take those 10 wealthy communities out. One twenty, very close. One hundred twenty, and they still did not surpass the amount awarded to just seven wealthy communities. I heard someone say today, and I wish I could remember the quote. It was perfect. You know, it, it, he, they just talked about having this system that is at its core underfunded, and how they create safety valves for communities that you know, are part of their power base or privileged so that only those schools that they don't care about, the schools serving those students they don't believe in or care about, suffer from that underfunding. And I thought this was a perfect example of that. Yes, ma'am. I think this is the basis for a lawsuit. So we'll talk about that. So this is just who got denied? 22% of majority white schools were denied, just flat out denied. 74% um, of majority Hispanic schools were flat out denied. And 80% of majority black schools were flat out denied. 22 to 80. Now, there was an interesting category in the data. When CPS, this comes from data released by Sarah Cart through a Freedom of Information Act request. Sarah got the data from CPS, but it didn't come with demographic data. It was just the name of the school, how much they requested, how much they got, and then a couple other categories, but no demographics, income, race. And so we then took that, Sarah wrote a couple of stories using that data. She released it publicly. She actually interviewed me for one of the stories she wrote, and I asked her about it, and she sent me a link to the data. And so we then took that data, our policy teams took that data and added demographic data, went into the CPS <laughs> database and added demographics for every one of those schools so that we could conduct the analysis that led to this. One of the columns in the spreadsheet that CPS released says status of appeal. And in status, they had categories like approved by appeals committee, denied by appeals committee, approved by appeals committee, denied by appeals committee, resolved by network, resolved by network, denied, resolved by network. And so we began to wonder, what does resolved by network mean? Because this is an ethical question for us, especially when we looked at the dollar amount given to students or schools resolved by network. They were all zeros. And so if we include them in the data set, it really helps us to show the disparity because they're all zeroed out. And they're mostly schools of color. In fact, all of them are schools of color. But maybe it was resolved. What do we do? We have a, an ethical situation here where we want to represent this accurately. And so we did the only thing we could do. We sent a standard email to the principal of every school that had resolved by network listed. And the email said, C yes, CPS released the appeals data, and we see that your school says, quote unquote, resolved by network. Can you please tell us what this means for you and your school? And so, I received about 15 responses, and I'm going to read three of them to you. And now I might actually sit down. <laughs> Sorry, I'm blind. I'm happy you were able to finally get a decision on our staffing appeal in writing. Nothing, is, nothing has ever been communicated to our school documenting the appeals results. And ODLSS, that's special education in CPS, 
ODLSS manager was sent to audit our staffing allocations. This is the third time in the process our current staffing allocation was reviewed. The district manager put no response in writing to the school. We've gone an entire year understaffed despite completing a never-ending staffing appeal. The understaffing has negatively impacted student performance, teacher morale, and safety. Response number two, we were denied. We are still in need and running an extremely poor program as a result of the shortage. We had to enroll several students with out-of-district IEPs who needed services, but no additional staffing was granted. We now have an even larger caseload as the year has progressed, and students are assigned classroom assistants who don't exist. The third one, the chief denied my request, and that was the end of it. The district administrator has blocked or stalled every staffing request. I can't do this anymore. I'm interviewing. My building is going up in flames by design. It's just sad. Our kids are trash to them. So now we know what resolve by network means, right? It means denied without even getting a hearing from this appeals, this shadowy appeals committee that no one really has ever seen. Because it's not like you get an appeal and you get to go and argue for it. Your paperwork gets forwarded somewhere, and theoretically at least someone in some committee somewhere in central office makes a decision about your appeal. So these schools didn't even get that. They were denied by a network chief. In CPS, they're divided by networks. So there might be 40 schools in the networks, and those 40 schools are ran or sort of overlooked by a chief, a network chief. And when you submit your appeal, it first goes through the chief. And they get to decide whether it goes on to the district. And so I began to wonder, by racial category, what schools got treated this way? What schools got denied by a middleman without even getting a hearing? And this is what I found. No school serving majority white students was treated that way. They all got a hearing, every single one. 47% of school serving Hispanic students were, did not even get the respect to get a hearing. And 56% of schools serving African American students were equally disrespected didn't even get a hearing, resolved by network. And so now that we knew what resolved by network meant, we included them in our data set, right? So I'm going to close the presentation. There's more, but I think I've gone over enough. You know, this is happening in a district that has a pattern of making decisions at the district level. When we say the district level, we mean city hall because the district doesn't run itself. The mayor's office runs the district, pure and simple. And so this is an office that has a pattern of decision making where all of us are being starved, but some of us are being treated worse than others. You know, the 50 schools are talked about a lot. Let's put that aside for just a second and look at this year. Three schools that serve majority black communities. They have tried to close three just this year and all three are high performing, level one or one plus. They all have good enrollment. So none of the former reasons and justifications apply. They have tried to shut down three just year, this year, and maybe all three, definitely two of them, were shut down in the service of demands that came from communities that were far less poor and far less black. In Beverly, it was trying to shut down Kellogg in the service of Mount Greenwood. Today, it's trying to shut down NTA in the service of South Loop. Right? We have, 
So they want the, there's a, there's a, a faction in South Hoop that want to take NTA away from the students who have it, so mostly it's a really nice looking school, great looking building. It's fully enrolled, they're trying to say it's under enrolled, but it's under enrolled on purpose because they have this regional gifted program that goes up a grade. And so they, they're leaving spaces because they haven't gotten all the grades in yet. But all of the grades they have are fully enrolled. <laughs> Right? And the folks in South Loop who said, we want that school. We want that for our kids. And the mayor's office is and attempting to shut it down so that they can convert it into a high school for more well-to-do South Loop parents. Um, and so you have that. You have, did any, any of you all see the Sarah Carp piece maybe six months ago about the hiring pool, the teacher quality pool, where they're not even letting candidates go straight to principals even anymore. They're filtering people out at the central central office level. And Sarah Carp did a free oh, look, Sarah Sarah's everywhere. <laughs> she did a Freedom of Information Act request and got the private firm that they hired to do this to release the results. And the results show, I want to quote this, I wish I didn't close my computer because I want to quote this accurately. Hope it'll pop up soon. The results show that 26% of white applicants were weeded out. 58% of, of Hispanic applicants were weeded out. And, excuse me, 42% uh, of Hispanic applicants were weeded out. And 55% of black applicants were weeded out. I could probably tell you 20 more stories. But the point is that this mayor's office has established a pattern of decision making that privileges, that is not good for anyone. None of us <laughs> have ideal resources in our schools. Period. And within that context, make some of us feel a little bit better off than others by privileging their needs over others. I'm making sense here. Yeah. And so I'm going to do something a little different here today. Um, I have been meeting with organizations. This is the second time I've done this publicly. I've been doing a lot of private briefings on this data. The report's not done yet. But I have one. You know, what we found does not belong to us. Right? What we found does not belong to us. We're not the ones who need to hold the press conference. This city needs to come together and hold the press conference on this. Everybody who gives a damn needs to come together on this. And so we have been briefing various organizations all the way from Raise Your Hand to Southsiders Organized for Liberty, or for Unity and Liberation, and everybody in between six different um, legal advocacy organizations, some public, some private firms that do pro bono work, um, and brief them on this and gotten their input in terms of what do we do next about this? Because we can't release this and it's always a press release, big deal. There has to be some movement. There has to be some behind the scenes organization that outlives the press conference that outlives the campaign to raise public awareness. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so I, what I want to ask you guys is to talk to each other for just a second. Uh, and while you all are doing that, I'm going to see if my man can go on a beer run. <laughs> 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 I want you guys to talk to each other. If, if, if you were me and you had just discovered this, which get in groups, and um, what would you do? Yes, sir. I did have just one question for you. Let's talk about it. There were $24 million frozen, and they gave $3 million of it to the schools. Yeah. What happened to the other $21 yeah. million? Oh, yeah, uh, just whatever. Make it cold, Pat. Whatever. No. Cold. 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 Cold, yeah. I'm an ex beer vendor from Wrigley, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Can you picture me? Who's waiting now? Who wants to hey, make sure Blue Moon is in there somewhere. Blue Moon, guys. I get to pick at least one, right? Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, 
So I was going to open it up to questions after the conversation. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, but you asked the question. Yeah. So it's not just tw that, the 24 million, it's just the schools that request it. Mm -hmm. The 158 schools that request it, right? There were like 450 that didn't request it. Why? Why? <laughs> so when we polled our principals, 84% said that their funding was inadequate for special education needs. But only 30% apply. That's 54%. That's hundreds of schools that did not apply. And so remember when I said they're pitting general education needs against special education needs? Well, they did that. So they preloaded that. They would tell principals ahead of time, if you have an AP, an assistant principal, don't even think about applying. Because the first thing we're going to tell you is get rid of your assistant principal. So if I don't want to get rid of my assistant principal, am I going to apply? If I don't want to get rid of my clerk, if I don't want to get rid of a teacher, another thing that they told us is that they made them feel like they were inadequate for applying, that I'm going to take the submission of an appeal as evidence that you don't know how to work your budget. Like, figure it out. And if you can't figure it out, some, if you can't figure out how to cover $600,000 worth of services with $50,000, then somehow you're incompetent. And so with that kind of hostility, with that kind of abusive supervision, the 158, frankly, is a surprise. that <laughs> it wasn't lower. Like, it was... In that context, 158 schools still apply. And we saw what happened to them. And so we have this thing like denial by chilling effect or denial by intimidation. Like those numbers would look even worse. So there are several hundreds of schools that aren't even in that number, but we know they got zero because they did not apply. And so it's hundreds of, it's tens if not hundreds of millions more. And, but your question is, where did it go? Whatever their priorities are. Maybe they're spending it to pay Bank of America some excessive interest on the loan they bar just borrowed. Maybe they're spending it, maybe they're spending it to pay Sodexo Magic the hundreds of millions of dollars that they're giving them in the, on that contract to supervise custodians and engineers in schools that become more and more filthy as the days go by. So this is the key, like the money was never really there, <laughs> right? This is the point, it's like it's a number on a line, right? They never intended on actually putting that money up because, you know, when I'm a principal, I'm just looking at a computer and numbers. There's no money at my school. This is just what they say I can spend. And then when I spend it, it, the money actually comes out of central office. Nowhere, not anywhere in the school, central office writes the check. And so when you get your budget, it's just, this is the money we have at central office for you. This year it was, this is the money, but you can't even touch these, this money, but it ain't, isn't money. It's just the line that says you have, but there's never really any money there. Yeah. So I would like you guys to talk, because I've been up here talking for a long time. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You know, Karen and Jesse and I have been texting back and forth about coming together to meeting. Apparently her schedule had just broke something. And <laughs> it, it, something's happening where we haven't been able to meet up on this, but we are going to meet. I have had people who I have briefed on this, and they have texted Karen and Jesse right there in the meeting. You need to see this. And Karen has said, I want to meet with you about this. We just haven't made it happen yet for some reason. Uh, Don. And in that email, I said that Troy um, is a strong advocate of data-driven policy. <laughs> See what I mean? I, was, I wasn't making that up. Uh, imagine if we had a city that was run 
yeah. with data-driven policy. Yeah. You mean a mayor who knows data? What would that be? <laughs> what? So Tori is asking us, what, what do we think the next step should be? Well, uh, I think we should write letters to Ron. I think we should uh, organize a protest outside of CPS. Uh, I think we should uh, pitch in, pass a basket around tonight and pitch in money for the schools. No, I don't think we should do any of those things. <laughs> what I think we should do is I think we need new leadership at the top. Yeah. We, need, we, need, we need new bosses. But who are the bosses? Who's the boss? The mayor, because of the non-elected It's us. <laughs> We're the boss because we get to hire and fire the mayor. And I yes. think we need to fire the mayor. Yeah. And some of us are urging this gentleman here to seriously consider running for mayor. Yeah. Okay, I ruined your entire plan now, Troy, because we all agree we're unanimous on this. We know what the next step is. So I mean, please should, continue. I think they should oh. sue, but you've already talked to people about suing. So is anybody uh, biting on this yes. one? Yeah. Good. Yes. Good. Good. Who? who I'm who? not saying oh, Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> but there are three very influential, somewhat powerful, no, four uh, institutions. Good. Some governmental, some nonprofit, some private. Two nonprofit, one private, one governmental, that are very interested and concerned and want to come together to talk and meet about strategy. So that's what we're doing. Cool? Uh, you were next. Yes, ma'am. Can you reach and then, out to uh, like WCBT yeah. Radio, Venturovsky, <laughs> here on his show, or the, I, think, I think Dick Kay has a show on the weekend. I mean, they, he's already been interviewed by a lot of different governors. Ben? Ben yeah, I've been on the show. I'll oh, go again. Okay. You have recently? Um, Very what was recently. that? That was like two months ago, maybe? Oh, okay. I was on the same show. Yeah, you, you called in on that show. Uh, I remember. Uh, <laughs> I just was on Ben's today talking about you, and he said after it was done that he should call you and invite you back on the show today. So I, I'm talking to small groups about this. I'm not going on the air about this just yet. Um, I want us to have a sense of what we're going to do. Um, and so we, th there's a lot more meeting and planning that needs to happen. Um, Ma'am and then sir. And then Diane. That group is interesting. She she asked if there are a group of is there talk about funding a test case? I don't know what you mean by test. Finding finding, finding a test case. Or finding a test case. Yeah. Federal courts. If it violates federal law, finding a test case purposely. So there are two groups of lawyers. There's the group that wrote that letter and there's the groups that I've been meeting with. Overlaps a little bit, but not a lot. Um, the group that wrote the letter is interesting. Their strategy has been to try and meet with CPS and say, this is what we found. Um, it should be addressed. What is your official response? Um, and, you know, in my thinking, they know what they're doing. They know what you found. It was designed to do what you found. They don't care. Uh, but that's been their strategy. Um, when I have spoken to the other group of attorneys, there has been more talk about, okay, well you have the Department of Justice, probably won't get, get anywhere with that right now, maybe there's some things they can do, but they can't pursue a, they can actually do some things. They're not going to pursue an actual case under this administration, but the, the lifers, the people who've done that job for life, I've met with three of them so far can do things. I don't know what they are, but they've said, hey, we, we can do this, but there's ways we can help. We should keep talking. So we'll see. Um, and and um, the other attorneys have talked about, so there's a Justice Department case, there's a potential, there won't be a civil rights case pursued, at least not under this administration. Uh, then there's a lawsuit. 
right? And that's when conversation around, okay, what kind of lawsuit would this be? You have class action and you have um, one or two folks who might represent. Uh, I think that's what you're talking about. And that has not been decided yet. Those conversations, like, like right now, we're in the infancy stage of these conversations. So it hasn't been decided yet, but it's come up. And I think, gentlemen, sir. Sorry. Uh, my question is, <laughs> The mayor is not initiating these programs of disinvestment. That's coming from higher, from somewhere other than him. Good point. And, and my, my question to you is, have you any idea how far up this madness goes? So I'm so glad he said that, because I like to focus people on the mayor's office. I usually don't say the mayor. I say the mayor's office. Because the people who, he, he works on behalf of the people who put him in there to do what he's doing. Like, you have a $6 billion budget with CPS. I don't know how many billions the city is, maybe three or four billion with the city, the park districts combined. Right? That public money. And not just the, the billions per year, but the billions in credit <laughs> that you can use your credit to borrow on represent massive profit potential for private investors if they can get their Manchurian into that office. And when they get him in, they come with a staff to make sure he does what he was put there to do. You know, whether they're, you know, and I can't, you know, and, and this is just common sense talking, right? I, I couldn't tell you, well, that one is from Chase, man, Chase, and that one's from uh, Morgan Stanley, and that one's from Wells Fargo, and that one over there is from, you know, wh wherever. <laughs> but we know that when he got in, I remember there was an article that was published three years into his term, a little less than four years. Uh, and it was on the front page of the Tribune. And it said, inside Rahm Emanuel's political cash machine. Front page. <laughs> and they analyzed his top 100 donors and 60 of his top 100 donors had all gotten some kind of contract with the city, the school system, or some public entity at the mayor's office influences or control. 60 of them. So. You know, and it also said that, uh, I remember it said that he had met, he basically met with his donors so much that it encompassed over half of his work days, meeting with his donors. Every other day he was meeting with the donor and after many of those meetings, there would be some sort of contract or thing announced that would benefit the donor. All right, that's coordinated. All right, there's a staff in place to make sure they get out of our tax dollars what they put him in there to get. Am I asking your question, brother, or am I oh, responding yeah. to it? <laughs> no, and so when so I say the mayor's office, I mean exactly what you mean. Mm -hmm. Sir. Oh, wait, wait, was so, there someone after you? Yeah, there was someone. I was going to ask a similar question, but I was going to okay. say privatization takes a lot of money away from right. our I mean, that's what this is about. Exactly. And that's so one of the forms it takes, that it takes privatization. Other forms are just payday loans to pay school district debt. Uh, not raising enough revenue so you'll be in a position where you have to take out a payday loan. So that you'll have to commit your daughter's tax dollars to his campaign don't. Right? Sir. I just, I find it horrible, the differences, but it doesn't get to the point that it's entirely <coughs> underfunded and not only underfunded by the city, but by the state. Best. Um, and without, you know, fighting over non-existent dollars can only go so far. How do you get to the point where there's enough funds in the system to adequately educate our children? So that's part of what I wanted you all to discuss. <laughs> um, I was hoping it would come out. So it's like what we've got is everybody's asking me. And I'm like, I can give you my 
point of view, but I really want to get yours. And so I'll give you my point of view. Go downtown. Look up. Who's thirsty now? Who's ready now? <laughs> and then tell me why you are looking up downtown that this city is broke. Oh, yeah. Right. Tell me. Can, can I offer a comment on that? Sure. Um, read Tom Tress's book. Oh, yeah. Chicago is not broke. Chicago is not broke. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who money out here? And he has outlined a number of strategies that, the, that they, a mayoral candidate could campaign on to get money to finance all the schools at the very top level. It's there. So, it, you know, it, it's just a question of being committed to getting the money and putting it in schools. It's absolutely there. You got a bottle over there, right? Uh, I think you said there were twist offs. No? Oh, okay. Those are twist offs. Cool. Uh, I asked. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so now you guys can talk over the drink. We're going to take. Yes, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you Ooh, that's ordered. <laughs> um, I would like to get some feedback from you all and some ideas from you all. This is going to be quick. Uh, because we've taken a lot of time, but if you could take at least five minutes to talk to each other about what you believe should happen next, report out five minutes later, and then we'll uh, say goodbye and keep everybody updated. Is that cool? All right. All right. Thank you. We did discuss some solutions. Uh, we talked about... Um, this young man was just enthralling us with a story about how schools have things, uh, resources within them that could make money for the school and then kind of be self-sustaining. So he's talking about these youth kids. Profit. A, a potential there to make money by maybe selling food or opening some sort of restaurant or pop-up in some of the school buildings when they're not in use. Um, we talked about even general funding things that we know. We know there's a lottery in this state that's supposed to be for education. Where's that money going? You know, we know that we pay ridiculous tolls. Where's that money going? Uh, none of the things that have been said traditionally are here to fund our schools, fund our schools. And so it's supposed to fund our school. Um, I talked about Denver. Uh, they seem to be doing really well with their new business endeavors and, and not being in debt and funding schools. You know, if we're going to have it anyway, why are we not using these things to, to bolster education? We know that education um, changes communities, it changes lives, it changes families. Why are we not using these things then to bolster our students? I'm a teacher. Um, and, and a recent, semi-recent law school grad, because I'm looking to get out, like most teachers who've been doing it for so long, because you can't take the abuse. But, but I sit in a, in a classroom with kids who are high school age, who can't read and write, who don't have uh, pencils, who don't have paper, and we're buying this stuff, we're bringing it in, and you look at all of this, and you look at the, I was talking to them about how we get paid to do things in our school. Um, I, I probably shouldn't say the name, I'm probably, this is probably gonna result in another firing. I get fired a lot, talked about this. Um, but teachers are paid to go to yoga after school. Like, this is waste. What? Like, oh, sign up for yoga, and if you go, you'll get paid, or you'll get part of your hourly rate. You know, this is waste. And it's in a poor school, in a poor neighborhood where, where yeah, people don't know this is happening, right? Where um, you, there's a computer training after school. Um, if you go, you'll be paid an hourly rate. The thing about that is, is that, right, we're saying we don't have money. We don't have money to give our kids what they need. We don't have money to give them um, um, the education they deserve, but yet we're finding ways to pay for things. As a teacher, it benefits me to go to computer training after work, so I don't need to be paid for that. I'm not saying that my time is not valuable. I think it is. I have a family, you know, we have other things. But, but when money is diverted in this way, and, and in a school that we know to be poor and we know to be failing, I don't understand how the city can keep saying, I'm broke, I'm broke, I'm broke, but they're paying people to go to yoga. And, and you get paid for anything in that building. And, and, and I think that that happens around the city so much more than we know, and in so many more uh, ways than I'm even privy to seeing. I, you th think about what gets paid for in the schools. If we could really be honest about, like give three teachers a red pen. Here's your solution to funding the schools. Give three teachers a red pen and let us follow the money. We'll get you the money. We'll take care of them, we'll fund the schools. I mean, because it's, it's just gross. It's, un it's, it's inherently unfair to keep pretending that we don't have the resources for our students while we do things like send kids on a charter bus to the state basketball game when nobody can read and write and pay teachers to go to yoga. My two cents.
All right. Elsewhere. Okay. So this sounds like gross um, corruption at the part of uh, the, uh, the mayor's office and the mayor. Um, when 60 out of 100 of his top donors have come away with contracts. So why is it we can't call in the FBI? Trump has already, um, you know, threatened Brom in the city of Chicago, so he's no friend. So why can't we call in the FBI? Or why can't we call in the state's attorney's office to do an investigation about the corruption in the mayor's office? So. Questions are good, but I want ideas. <laughs> so are those are you framing those as ideas or questions for me? Like why can't we? We want to call in the FBI. Good. Uh, we also came up with the idea of uniting communities. Uh, frankly, your name would go far if we had something to hand out when we're door knocking during the gubernatorial, during all the races that are coming up. Uh, during the aldermanic and the mayorals next year, if we really had something to rally people in all communities, and we all pledged as PDA members to walk around the city in every neighborhood and rally different organizations, we could pull people together and unite them because it, I love your ideas, but I hate that teachers have to fundraise. I'm a teacher too. I know in schools up here on the north side, parents fundraise a lot, and that just makes the gap wider because obviously the school with the most well-moneyed parents get all the best computer labs. We really need to unite under an umbrella organizations to say all these children fully fund, our schools. Fully, fund fully fund our schools and all these children deserve the best. There are children. Fully fund the schools. Fully fund the schools. <laughs> That's from you, our group here. You touched on it when you were talking about corruption. <clears throat> because corruption actually is, to me, is the biggest subject in the state of Illinois. Yeah. And I learned this on a city scale in a very small way, but it was a great lesson. Uh, I live in Albany Park, and we had a new library built a couple of years ago. We didn't need a new library. We had a perfectly good library, but they tore down our old library. We were without a library for two years, and they built a library. So we watched this project very closely. Uh, we got the budget for the project. We went down to the Public Building Commission who built the building, and we really followed it closely. We did comparables in other areas of the country, and we found out that a 16,000 square foot library costs between 2.5 and $5 million to build uh, in an urban area. So uh, what do you think the budget for the Albany Park Library was? Fifteen million dollars. So at the same time, our library, our library was closed for a little over two years. We didn't have a library. It's a neighborhood with lots of first-generation people. That library is very important. Uh, at the same time, the high school across the street fired their librarian. Um, a nearby elementary school completely eliminated its library because they needed the space. They needed more classroom space. So I forgot to say, this library was built all with TIF funds. $15 million of TIF money, which is, of course, money diverted from property taxes. About 53% of that was supposed to go to the schools. Who got those contracts? Yeah, bingo. Who got those contracts? <laughs> exactly. This was a project put together by Marge Lorino, and she made sure that there was enough to go around for everybody in the true Lorino tradition. If you're from the 39th Ward, you know all about that. There are a few 39th Warders here tonight. So we need to elect better aldermen. I mean, how do we get rid of the corruption? Because a lot of the, the money is in the corruption. Illinois is the fifth uh, richest state in the union. So we've got plenty of money. We're not like Alabama where they don't have the money. We've got the money. It's just not going to the right places. Corruption is our number one big enemy and should be the number one subject in this gubernatorial election, by the way. I haven't heard anybody mention it yet. The problem with, the problem with that corruption is that the public, the problem with the corruption is that the public in the city, in the county, and in the state have a history of over 100 years of corruption 
and nobody thinks there's anything to do with it. People feel like it's a way of doing business. I know I grew up feeling that way. Uh, I grew up with a grandfather who had a business and in order to stay in business, uh, had one of his brothers go with envelopes to aldermen's offices. That brazenness has changed. It's not an envelope, but it's still there and people feel helpless. And without inspired leadership, nobody is going to feel like there's anything they can do. And so we need good people to run for office and we need support of those who are aware to get the word out to those who aren't aware. You know, one thing I did was, we have to take over the Democratic Party. I supported uh, three candidates who were running for committeemen in the last election. Two of them won, and one of them came close. And she happens to be sitting right in the audience here tonight. Diane DeLayden from the 40th Ward. She's running for, uh, she's already announced, she's running for the 40th Ward Alderman, again, against Pat O'Connor. Yes. This time she's going to win, and I think we all should help her. That's something we can do. So just to piggyback off of what's been said about corruption and about the feeling of helplessness and, um, and the way that we do business, so this doesn't work. Your voice has to be loud. The okay. won't do anything. Okay, so I think the long, like the long con or the long game is publicly funded campaigns. Yeah. So yeah. at the federal level, like that's kind of, I mean, that's oh, that's a lot bigger. That's a lot bigger of a hill to get over. But at the local level, like starting in the alderman races or these like city councils or or I'll CPS. Stand up, stand up yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just I just wanted to add that I think the long con and the solution to the corruption is like publicly funded campaigns at the local level. So in the short term, it's another party which you need. Until we are publicly funny, you have to have like a separate party from the demo publicans. Because they're one party that pretends to fight. Oh, okay. pretends to fight. Uh, my, my idea is, have you guys heard of Take Charge Chicago, where we're going to have a, a term limit on mayor, and then we're going to have a consumer advocate whose salary will be cut from several hundred thousand back to 80,000. So you all can find that petition anywhere in the city so that Romster will only have the two terms he's got. So one last comment, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. 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 Uh, Let's keep the questions yeah. going. So this is, I guess, getting back to the original question of what to do about education funding. And it just seems bizarre to me that funding isn't done at a flat you know, dollar per, per student rate. It's, it seems like you know schools fighting over their portion of a small pot, and it, why is why is it not funded at the citywide level? Of your school has X students, they get X you know times this many dollars to fund their their program. Why is it that you know the the school two schools with the same number of students get vastly different you know funding? So. What I just talked about is special education. This we're going to give you what we gave you last year thing. Okay. Uh, general education, that's how it's funded. Okay. So it's inadequately funded because the amount that's given per pupil is too low. Okay. Right? And the amount that's given for SPED is also too low. And so when you have two amounts that are too low and you have to meet one need at the expense of the other, somewhat, it's already set up for both to suffer. When you have to play them off against each other, one is going to suffer even worse. Well, I mean, that's, that's what I meant. When you have the, the special education budget taking bites out of the general education budget, suddenly a school that you know, has a larger special education class than another comparable sized school, you end up with a smaller budget for that same number of, of you know, non-special education students just because the special education budget had to take larger and larger chunks out of it. Exactly. So I'm going to wrap this up. I want to thank you all for listening. I'm going to thank you for your ideas. 
Don wants to ask one more question. He's yeah. apparently yeah. he's not going to let me give this up. Is this the question I think is going hey, to be? Hey, Don, before you ask your question, if you want to get active if you want to get active with um, a group of progressive Democrats more, that are about that are about <laughs> creating community and bringing groups together, sign up on my sign up sheet. I forgot to do that in my commercial earlier, and I will be in touch with you. Or follow PDA Chicagoland on Facebook, and I tr try to post. Dr. Laura tries to post. We try to keep it up to date. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks for. Thanks for